This is Mahadevan Krishnan from Alameda Applied Sciences Corporation talking today about AASC's metal plasma thruster propulsion for CubeSats. My co-authors John Frankovich and Catherine Vellis and Simon Lehmans made some helpful contributions a few years earlier. This development has been supported by NASA under an SBIR contract. What I'd like to do today is to say a little bit about the metal plasma thruster and then move on to perform an evaluation using mission analysis of four different thruster candidates for CubeSats. We considered two missions, an LEO mission in which you need just 100 meters per second of delta V. You need about 70 meters per second to move it from one orbit to another and then use what remains on the, on the thruster for drag compensation. And a more challenging mission, which would require a kilometer per second of delta V, for example, to inject from cislunar space a 12U CubeSat, such as a capstone type satellite, into a lunar orbit, and then provide enough delta V to maintain that orbit for a few months. The way the analysis proceeds is by setting some key operating points for the thrusters and then using those operating parameters in order to estimate key outputs such as the wet mass, the volume, and what the mission capability is of these different engines so we can assess their pros and cons. So a few words about the metal plasma thruster first. It's an all solid state metal plasma thruster. It literally boils off about 20 micrograms of metal on each pulse a few milliseconds, ionizes it and spits it out at about 17 kilometers per second to give an impulse of around a quarter of a millinewton second. So you'd need four million of these pulses just to get to a thousand newton seconds. And you can see an example of these six pucks firing in some sequence here. And what you realize is that this is a highly scalable device. Each of these pucks can give you a thousand Newton seconds in a one U package. So six of these in a one U package can give you 6,000 Newton seconds and it's scalable. The PPU is rather simple, a 40 volt capacitor, no high voltages in it for grids or anything. And because it requires zero standby power, no heater to melt propellants, run neutralizers, zero standby power. It can lie dormant for a long time and at the end of the mission can be turned on instantly to, to do deorbiting, for example. And right now we're in a position to manufacture these devices with a short lead time of just months at a competitive price. Two papers have been published, one that describes the operating principles, and another one published more recently with our co-author Jonathan Mackey of NASA, Glenn Research, where we use the NASA sensitive thrust stand to make impulse and thrust measurements. We've been selected by Astra to deliver one of these as a flight ready unit, and it's been delivered a few weeks ago and integrated into the satellite for a launch in early 2022. And our mission, we're using 5,400 Newton seconds of impulse from these six pucks that you see here, would be in the first month or so to raise this 12U from its insertion orbit up by about 50 kilometers to an operating orbit. And at the end of the mission, to use the delta V that's left behind to drag it down to a rapid burn up from a lower orbit. The TRL of this thruster is six. We've measured, we've had shake tests now twice at QTS in Huntington Beach, California, 9.6 G RMS, sign sweep. We've measured the thrust and the impulse twice on the NASA thrust stand at GRC. We've integrated it into a satellite, Supernova here, for launch. We've simulated the orbit rays in our vacuum using several million pulses. We're at eight and a half million pulses right now and counting. 
we fired a total of 40 million pulses over a few years here. In other words, we've generated more than 10,000 newton seconds of impulse in vacuum already. Let's move on now to look at this comparison between this thruster, the MPT, and three other candidates, the N-Pulsion Indium Field Emission Electric Propulsion System, or the FEEP, the Thrust Me Iodine Ion Engine, and the Axion Ionic Liquid or Electro Spray Field Emission Electric Propulsion Device. Some attributes, 6,000 Newton seconds per U for the AASC and N-Pulsion thrusters, half of that for the iodine thruster, and much less than that, only 800 Newton seconds per U from the Axion tile. The thrust to power ratio is about 10 to 12 micronewtons per watt for three of these, but is twice that, 22 micronewtons per watt from the Axion tile, because it's more efficient. MPT, as I've said already, requires zero standby power, which is a big asset when you're power limited, and it doesn't require a neutralizer, so no heater needed, either to melt the indium, vaporize the iodine, or heat the electro, uh, the ionic liquid, or indeed heat up a thermionic electron gun. None of that's needed by the MPT. But all these candidates are modular and scalable for these small satellites. Now, before we do a mission analysis, it's useful to set some operating points for all these thrusters. You can take the literature of N-Pulsion shown here and look at these numbers in circles 1, 2, and 3. You can pick off at 40 watts the thrust of about 0.4 of a millinewton, the total impulse of 6,000, the ISP of 2,800 seconds, and use simple mathematics bookkeeping to derive an efficiency and a thrust to power of about 10 micronewtons per watt. And on the left here, circles 2 and 3, allow you to say that the wet mass of this device would be about a kilogram, it would occupy about one U of volume. Similarly, you can set an operating point for the Axion ionic liquid FEEP. Again, from their literature, the thrust is higher. I said the thrust to power efficiency of this device is twice that of the others, nearly one millinewton, but the volume is two U, twice that of impulsion, the wet mass is four kilograms, four times that of impulsion, and it gives a total impulse of only 1,500 newton seconds, one quarter of what impulsion gives. Similar analysis for the Thrust Me iodine engine, picking off from their published operating space, you find that the thrust is about half a millinewton. The ISP is much lower in this case from the literature only 700 to 1,000 seconds. And that means, of course, that it's not as fuel efficient as the other candidates. But it does give a total impulse of 5,000 newton seconds in a volume of one and a half U with a wet mass of nearly two kilograms. And its thrust to power is 11 micronewtons per watt. Last but not least, our metal plasma thruster. About half a millinewton of thrust at 40 watts an ISP of 1774 seconds, total impulse of 5400 newton seconds. Go through the math and you can derive a thrust to power ratio of 12 micronewtons per watt. Quite similar to N-Pulsion and Thrust Me, about half of uh, Axion. And here the wet mass is 1.67 kilograms. The volume is just shy of one U. If you put it all together, you can look at the first mission which might be inject to 500, but pull the satellite down to 375 because you'd, you'd like the lower altitude for better, higher resolution imaging, for example, if you're doing satellite imagery. And you can plot the time taken to do this maneuver as a function of available thruster power from 40 watts and below. And you can see that all of them will do it in under 30 or 40 days at 40 watts, with the Axion tile taking half the time because it has twice the thrust for the same power. But a key difference, whereas these other candidates 
are limited in their power operating range for various reasons, among them the need for standby power. The MPT, because it has zero standby power, can operate even all the way down to 10 watts or even lower. So in a situation where other systems are competing for available power on a small satellite, imagery, radio transmission, communications, with even a little bit of power left over, you can continue to provide thrust from the MPT. The IFM Nano is, uh, gives you the lowest wet mass and volume, but the MPT comes a close second for this mission. Now, they give you more than the 70 meters per second, many of them. So with what's left behind, you can do drag compensation in that orbit of 375. If you didn't combat drag, you'd just burn up in a month or two. So let's assume the drag is 200 micronewtons and go through some bookkeeping and find that N-pulsion, the thrust me and the MPT will all give you 200 to 250 days of drag compensation. Not quite a year, but close in that lower orbit. Tile, unfortunately, gives you only 76 meters per second of delta V because its impulse is low. So once you've done the orbital maneuver, there's precious little left for any drag compensation. That being said, instead of two modules, you could use six tile modules. And then you'd get 180 days of drag compensation. However, if you look at the wet mass, the Axion tile, six of them, has a mass of 12 kilograms versus just one or 1 1.7 for N-pulsion and the AASC. 12 kilograms is, is, you know, more than half the mass of the 12, of the uh, 22 kilogram satellite. Let's go look at the more challenging mission. Inject into a lunar orbit from some cislunar point. You'd need a kilometer per second of delta V. You'd fire all of these things at 120 watts. And you'd use multiple units, obviously, because you'd need 22,000 newton seconds to effect this maneuver. But what's interesting is you'll find that the N-Pulsion Nano, the Thrust Me Iodine engine, and the MPT, using four MPT arrays, four MPT units, all can do the job with a mass less than five kilograms and generate the thousand meters per second needed. The tile, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be able to do this. Even with 12 kilograms of wet mass, which is huge, it gives you only about 227 meters per second of delta V. So it falls short of the 1,000 meter per second requirement. N-pulsion and the MPT give you the 1,000 and then some. There's an extra 100 meters per second left over for orbit maintenance for a few months when you're around the moon. The iodine engine doesn't quite do that. So these are the two missions we've considered in order to evaluate the pros and cons of these different engines. Four of them were compared for two missions. The FEEP, the Indium, the Iodine Ion Engine and the MPT with molybdenum were all comparable in terms of wet mass and volume for both of these missions. The Axion Tile is more massive. The iodine engine might have to contend with possible corrosion contamination issues. There's a paper about that. All of these but the MPT require some standby power, either to melt the indium, heat the spray, or vaporize the iodine, and of course for neutralizer guns that tend to be thermionic emitters. The MPT, in summary, requires zero standby power, so it's very useful when there's a big power drain in a power-limited satellite from other systems. Even with a few watts, you could still be providing some impulse and thrust. The molybdenum pucks, interestingly, offer natural radiation shielding. So if you move the PPU, which is easily separated from the head, deep into the spacecraft for better shielding, you then just have wires from the PPU coming up to the head or the pucks. And last but not least, the fact that we have arrays of pucks in our arrays means that by firing them selectively, you can do two-axis control of the spacecraft, pitch and yaw, for example, 
And you can, for example, uh, desaturate the reaction wheels by just firing a few of these pucks off axis. Thank you very much for your attention.